Um, last week, as I mentioned, um, the words that Pastor Tyler shared with us uh, were just so amazing, that those closing words of John 17, and um, they were perfect for myself and my family. Um, this is the first time last week when we were in uh, the room, the first time that we were together, all of us worshiping. We stood for that final song uh, and for the scripture reading. My dad just, he popped right up. He wanted to stand. We're like, you don't have to stand, Dad. He's, he wanted to stand. He wanted to sing. He wanted to worship. Um, Matt led Rock of Ages. As soon as Matt said Rock of Ages, my mind went to those last few lines. It says, while I take my final breath, I'll rest upon your grace, and when I close my eyes in death, I'll wake to see your face. And right when Matt said Rock of Ages, my mind went there, and I just started kind of getting this sort of, you know, anxiousness for that part. And as it got to that part, my dad's reading those words and singing those words, and we all just wept. And my dad sat down after that, and so that's exactly how I picture it, is just falling asleep and waking up and seeing my Savior's face and seeing the scars in his hands. And so we just so enjoyed last week. Love just sitting there, seeing all the different people in our church, knowing there was more in the congregation and knowing that we were there distantly just worshiping with you guys and those words were just so, so amazing for us. Today, we shift into what is kind of, in many ways, uh, the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly ministry in his life, and it's kind of the beginning of his final descent, so to speak. You know, when you're on an airplane, oh, we're getting prepared for our final descent. That's what chapter 18 sort of signifies, the sort of final descent of his earthly life and ministry. He's going to spend the rest of the time of his earthly life, either alone or in the presence only of his enemies. And this final descent is eventually going to lead him to his death. So I want to pray and ask the Lord to help us just get the, the overall picture, the heaviness of this text, as this part of John kind of goes into really what is the darkest part of the book of John, as we're going to see the betrayal of Jesus and his arrest. Father, the, the words we sang this morning, just uh, so filled my heart with thankfulness and gratitude. Every song that was sang um, just had these lyrics that just I needed to sing today. And even as we go into this text, knowing that this is a dark part of the story, this is now early Friday morning, but we know that Sunday is coming. We know that you're going to make beauty from the ashes of John chapter 18. And we know that even in this life and in all the trials and struggles and pains that we endure, you are somehow in your way, you're going to make beauty from ashes. It seems so distant, seems so impossible, but with you, God, all things are possible. And we are grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, that you are at work in our midst working even in the darkest parts of our hearts, bringing light to the shadows, as we sang. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in John chapter 18, I'm just going to read the first two verses, and we'll continue as we go. So remember, the scene is that Jesus was in the temple with his disciples praying these last few weeks that we were in that, and so... Now we're going to see a, a shift in verse 1 here of chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words from John 17, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So we're shifting now. Jesus and his disciples go from this place, from the temple, and they go to a garden. And it's fitting that where everything began, 
in God's very good creation, the Garden of Eden, a life of paradise, now culminates and ends in a different garden, but one that would be known for suffering and pain. It's been thousands of years since Adam's sinful disobedience brought the cup of God's wrath into that perfect garden, but now through Jesus' perfect obedience, he's now going to accept the cup of God's wrath in a fallen garden. But before we get to this garden, I want to share with you guys something important, and it's about the path that was taken. This is where I'm going to make an attempt at doing our little uh, sort of thing here. I don't know how well this will work, but we're just going to try. Um, I don't know how to focus that, but, but this guy does. So while he does that, I will kind of walk you guys through a couple pictures here. So you guys have seen this map before, okay? It's, uh, this is the path we took. So uh, we just now we're at number five, which is the temple. Right now we're going to be walking through uh, number six and then on to seven. So seven is the garden, and six is what I want to mention to you guys first because it's important. This is... Uh, that is the, the east wall right there on the top. I know it's kind of hard to see. This is my family in front of it. So we are standing on the Mount of Olives right here, looking west towards Jerusalem. Um, you can sort of almost see the top of the dome, uh, which is where the temple would be uh, if the Dome of the Rock wasn't there. And just to the right, actually, I have it kind of zoomed in a little bit. In that circle there, uh, there's a gate. Uh, it's a big stone gate. Uh, I got another zoom in here. Um, you can kind of see, uh, sort of halfway down the picture, there, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tour bus right there. Okay, so if that's a tour bus, that's the gate right there. It's a big gate. It is a massive gate. That is called the Golden Gate. Uh, and the Golden Gate, I'm going to put my little shield back up here. The Golden Gate is... Um, also sometimes called the gate beautiful. Uh, and you'll read of it sometimes in the Bible called the, go- the gate beautiful, but it's also called the golden gate. And it's the gate that Jesus would have rode into on Palm Sunday. So as he rode in on Palm Sunday, you can bring the lights back up and I'll go to some other pictures later but you can, so they can read their Bibles. Um, it's the gate he would have rode into on Palm Sunday just the week before the events that are happening right now. He's gonna come into the city on that day, Palm Sunday, and declare his arrival as the Messiah, and the King. But now it's the gate that he's leaving out of in John 18. But this time, he's not going through it as Messiah and King. He's going out of the gate as the sacrificial lamb. He's going to be leaving Jerusalem with a different role. Now this gate, the one that you just saw, was probably built around 520 AD. It's not original, but it was built on top of the original gate because Jerusalem was... Uh, destroyed and totally ruined in 70 AD. And so years later, uh, the gates and the walls were rebuilt. So that one was from about 520. It's the oldest one that's standing in Jerusalem. But if you notice in the picture, it was shut. It didn't really look like a gate. It looked like kind of a wall with sort of some ornate um, sort of, uh, you know, borders. And there's an important reason for why that gate has been shut. Uh, During the Ottoman Empire, which was a a Muslim empire that ruled over Israel from 1517 to 1917, 400 years, uh, there was a a sultan, kind of the the, the main guy overseeing the Ottoman Empire. His name was Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, You see his name all over the old city because he built a lot of the structures that we see today. And he had the Golden Gate sealed in 1541. And there's a reason why he had it sealed. Suleiman knew of a biblical prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, In Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18, the prophet Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord leave the temple through what he says is the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. So he sees the glory of the Lord leave out the east gate. And Ezekiel says that glory then moves east of the city to the Mount of Olives. So it goes from the city through the east gate and ends up at the Mount of Olives. Here's what it says in Ezekiel eleven twenty three: The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. Now that could be a reference to the events right here in John 18. The great high priest 
the sacrificial lamb of God is leaving out of the eastern gate and going to the Mount of Olives, soon to be sacrificing himself for the sins of God's people. That could be what Ezekiel saw, the glory of the Lord leaving the city, going out the east gate, the sacrificial lamb going to the Mount of Olives to be betrayed and arrested so that he could save the sins of his people. That might be what Ezekiel saw. But later, Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord return to the temple through the gate facing east. So he sees a return of the glory of the Lord going through that same gate. Here's what it says in Ezekiel 43, verse 1. Ezekiel says, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Now, we haven't seen that yet. So what's he talking about? Because we've never really seen that. Because, you know, when he came in on the donkey, it wasn't like that. So what is this all about? What does this mean that the glory of the Lord is going to return? Right, so we're not even talking about the entrance, Palm Sunday, because that wasn't a return. That was the initial entrance. So there's going to be some kind of return that's going to be the sound of many waters and shining the whole earth. What is he talking about? Well, that event has not happened yet because there's still, church, another time that is yet to come where the king of kings will walk through his beautiful gate. I'd like you to go to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. In this part of the story, Jesus had already resurrected. So this is after John 18. He's already been crucified. He died. He rose again. And now for the last 40 days, he's been with his disciples. The risen Christ, the King of Kings, has been alive on the earth for 40 days, walking all throughout the land, throughout Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says that they left Jerusalem to go out to the Mount of Olives. They likely walked through the gate beautiful to get there. And since this is now the risen Lord walking through the gate, It could also be that the Ezekiel prophecy of the glory of the Lord leaving through the eastern gate could be that instance, because that's the risen Lord. That is the glory of the Lord leaving the city out the gate to the Mount of Olives. Or it could be John 18, verse 1, or it could be both. Either way, it's the glory of the Lord, the sacrificial lamb or the risen Christ leaving out that gate, going to the Mount of Olives. That's what's happening But that's what we're going to see here in Acts chapter 1, but still we have to ask ourselves, when does that glory return? Well, we're going to find out here in Acts chapter 1. Verse 6, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, and in the previous verses it says that they went to the Mount of Olives, so you can read before, but they're at the Mount of Olives. When they had come together at the Mount of Olives, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? To Israel. So they're still obsessing over when Jesus will restore a physical rule and reign over their enemies. That's what they still want to see. And not just the spiritual freedom from sin. Yeah, that's great. But when are you going to establish your kingdom on the earth? Now he doesn't say, oh, I'm never going to do that. This is all just spiritual. He doesn't say that. He actually acknowledges that, yeah, that, that day's going to come. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to physically have my kingdom on the earth. But here's what he tells them. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So he's saying, oh, that, that, that day's coming, but that's not for you to know. So there is going to be the King of Kings coming upon the earth to establish his kingdom forever and ever. With no sin, no sickness, no death, and no tears. So he acknowledges that, but he says, that's just not for you to know. He goes, but, so he's kind of saying, in the meantime, since you can't know that day, in the meantime, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that's going to happen between now and when I do come back. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, they were just watching him talk, all of a sudden, he was lifted up in the air. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand looking into heaven? Now, for me, that's about the dumbest question I've ever heard. I'd be like, did, did you, did you, the, the guy flew. He flew. He's gone. But nonetheless, these guys said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? They said, this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the same way that he went up, he's going to come back in that same exact way. So what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Because I want to tell you. In Zechariah, another prophecy that Suleiman the Magnificent feared, the prophet Zechariah says this about the second coming of the Lord, which of course, as we know, has not yet happened. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Zechariah says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. So all the things that the, the world has stolen from you, so we're talking even physical things here, the spoil that was taken from you will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Okay, that hasn't happened yet. Jerusalem's been attacked a lot of times, but not by all the nations. Then the Lord, this is verse 3, then the Lord... The Lord himself will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And we haven't seen this Jesus yet. He came in on a donkey. We haven't seen him come in on a war horse yet to fight the nations as he would be going to battle. We haven't seen that yet. We've seen him come to bring peace, but we have not yet seen him come to make war. And here's what it says in verse 4. <laughs> On that day that the Lord comes to make war, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So part of if the mountain's going north and south like this, it's going to be split like this, like that. There's going to be a valley leading straight into the city. So that part of half of the mount shall be moved northward, half the other would be going southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Az Azale. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. That's us. This reminds me of the book of Job when Job said of his own future he said, I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last, in that last day, he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin, my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. Job says, I know, with, even though I'm going to die with my, my own actual eyes, not anyone else's eyes, but these actual eyes, this flesh will stand with him on that day. There is a day yet to come, church, when the glory of the Lord, the King of kings himself, the Lord of lords, will return to the Mount of Olives in just the same way as he left the Mount of Olives. But this time, he's going to come to make war upon the nations. And when he returns, this mount will be split and made into a valley leading into the city and into the temple. And he will march into the city as if in battle with his holy ones with him. And that is you and me. And he will enter back into his holy city through that golden gate. The gate beautiful, victorious over sin and death as the king of kings. When my family... And I stood in that place. It was so surreal to stand not only in the place of history where Jesus ascended to heaven. That alone was just, in, just incredible to stand in this general place, this mount, knowing that this is where Jesus stood and, and ascended to heaven. But we stood there reading these scriptures knowing this was also a place of the future. Standing there knowing that this is the very place where the king of kings is going to return. His feet are going to stand upon the Mount of Olives where we were standing. Right there. 
knowing that there's going to come a day where he will stand there and I also will stand with him on that day and in that place. Church Brittany is going to stand with him on that day in that place. My dad's going to stand with him on that day and in that place. And with my own eyes, I will see God in the flesh. The king of kings returning to his city as a man of war, conquering once and for all. To be able to gaze upon that golden gate from the close distance of the Mount of Olives, one of the greatest sights that I've ever had the joy to behold. And Suleiman the Magnificent knew all of this. He knew this Messiah was coming. And so he had it sealed. He had it sealed with a 15-foot thick wall of stone. Not only that, he went above and beyond. He had a cemetery placed around the entrance because the Muslims knew that being a Jewish high priest or a Messiah, they wouldn't be allowed to step foot in a cemetery because that was considered unclean land. So you weren't allowed to step where the dead were. So it's like kind of planting a kryptonite garden there to prevent Superman from getting close. But what Suleiman didn't realize is that this high priest has the power over death. And when this high priest returns, there won't be a cemetery there because that cemetery is going to be empty. And what is unclean will be made clean. And what he also didn't realize is that Suleiman was actually fulfilling another biblical prophecy because later on in Ezekiel 44, towards the end, we read of the gate being closed. Is what it says. Ezekiel says, The man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. The Bible's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing. That gate's shut. Because the Lord of Lords walked through it, and it's not going to be open until the Lord of Lords returns through it. So, going back into John 18, if you're keeping track here, we've only gotten through a half a verse, but don't worry, this won't be a marathon sermon. But going back into John 18:1, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples, and they went across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met there with his disciples. So uh, a couple other photos here that I'd like to show you. Um, first, back to the map here. Uh, we're going to be crossing from, it's number six, down the valley. It's maybe a 20-minute walk. Uh, then there's the Brook Kidron kind of going north and south. And then just barely at the foot of this uh, little, tiny little mountain range is number seven there. Uh, and that's the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the Mount of Olives as it is today. Uh, a lot, many parts of the Mount of Olives uh, are still very uh, kind of natural and overrun, like with those olive trees. There's still olive trees all over the place. Uh, this here is specifically, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and uh, um, Gethsemane means oil press. And so there are still actually uh, lots of olive trees uh, that are still throughout this, um, this part. Here's my family um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, you can kind of almost see the city sort of in the background there. There's my mom and dad. Now, some of these trees here, that one in particular, um, this one here, uh, that tree and a lot of the ones that are in the Garden of Gethsemane actually uh, have some of the innermost parts of it um, are roughly 2,000 years old. Uh, they're very ancient trees, so some of these trees may have been even just little saplings uh, that were sprouting out of the ground uh, when Jesus was there in the garden. So uh, they're around a couple thousand years old, a few of these. Uh, so to be in this place and just picturing Jesus with his disciples, picturing Judas and that uh, those uh, officers coming to arrest him was... This another one of those um, very surreal moments for us. But to see that you know, these places are real. Um, this isn't fantasy. This isn't just 
you know, a, a fiction book. But these places are real. So it says in verse 3, So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Now that's a little throwback. A little throwback to the very first words that John records Jesus saying in the Gospel of John. If you remember way back when we started this book, when he met his first disciples, the first words that John records... Jesus meets some disciples and says, whom do you seek? He says to them, what do you want? What are you seeking? And now here on the night of betrayal, he sees Judas and says, Judas, whom do you seek? It's very sad. It's a sad bookend. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Notice Jesus' use of that phrase, I am. Am. He's declaring himself once again as God. And Judas betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So just that Jesus, just God himself speaking his name, caused them to fall backwards to the ground. That's the power of God. And I don't picture how some of the dramatizations, you know, I am he. I don't think that's how it went. I think Jesus was very humble, very just quiet, soft-spoken to I am he. But just that alone knocked them to the ground. So we asked them again after they fell down, whom do you seek? And they said again, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Speaking of disciples, And John knows that this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, that Jesus spoke earlier. When he was speaking in John 17 to his father, of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one, he says, except for the son of perdition, which is Judas. This is an interesting kind of double fulfillment that John notes. Not only does Jesus not lose any of his sheep eternally, he says, I haven't lost any of them, Father. But he's even more specifically speaking about the 12, other than Judas, as he mentions in his prayer. By Jesus asking Judas specifically to let these other guys go, the other 11, that's also fulfilling these words that were spoken to him in this prayer. He says, none of them were lost. I was the only one arrested. Now Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The other gospel accounts mention uh, that the servant's name was Malchus and that Jesus picked up the ear and miraculously replaced it on his head. Now this wasn't mentioned by John, but it's in the other ones. And Jesus said to Peter, when that happened, he says, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So a quick note here, what makes the fulfillment of Judas letting the other disciples go even more interesting is that Peter just attacked someone with a sword and cut his ear off, but yet wasn't arrested. That's only because that's what Jesus spoke. Otherwise, all those guys would have been arrested. So here's a physical attack, and they don't arrest Peter, but it's because the Scripture had to be fulfilled, and Jesus made it so. And don't you just got to wonder what happened to Malchus? I mean, the guy had to have gotten saved after that, don't you think? I mean, his ear just gets put back on, and so such a crazy story. But look what Jesus says here, and this is what we'll kind of focus on for the, kind of the, the closing up of, of this today. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I drink the cup that the Father has given me? Just a few moments before this, in the other Gospels, John doesn't note this, but in Matthew it says actually what kind of happened right before this, part of Jesus' prayer. In Matthew 26, verse 36, it says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further from them, he fell on his face and he prayed. And he said, my father, if it was possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping And he said to Peter, 
So could you not watch with me just one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again for the second time, Jesus went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, then your will be done. This cup from the Father is a cup of suffering, but not any kind of suffering. It's a specific suffering because it's a cup filled with God's justice, the full weight of the righteous law of God. As we say in our modern day, it's prosecution to the fullest extent of the law. That's what's in that cup. God, the creator of the universe and the creator of every single life that ever walked this earth, looks upon his own creation, scans the thousands of years of the history of mankind, and sees sin, rebellion, murder, arrogance, self-centeredness, disinterest, gossip, cruelty, sexual sin, adultery, lies, drunkenness, rape, racism, divisiveness, blasphemy, and idolatry of all kinds. That's all he sees. And in his righteous and pure justice, he fumes with anger because he is holy, because he's perfect and he's good and he's right, because God is love, because God is love, he hates wickedness. And he's been holding back his justice for centuries, holding it back like a dam trying to hold back water. He's been patiently allowing the sinful sons of men to make sacrifices of animals. He's like, look, you guys are the ones who sinned, but I'm patiently going to let you sacrifice animals as kind of this placeholder to temporarily delay my true justice. That was his mercy. He mercifully let us kill animals in place of us temporarily. But his patience must eventually give way to his righteous justice. And the time has come now for him to pour out his wrath upon the sins and the treasonous actions of humanity that have been committed against him for thousands of years and to prosecute all of us to the fullest extent of the law. And so he fills this cup with his wrath and his punishment set against us, we who have sinned against him. Can you drink that cup and live? Can you drink that cup and survive his wrath and punishment against your sin? Can you somehow exonerate yourself? Are you worthy enough to drink that cup to the last drop and escape his righteous justice, the penalty of your sin? Can you, by drinking down that cup, free yourself and free all of us from the curse upon humanity due to our sin? I know you know the answer, at least I hope you know the answer. The answer is no, you can't do that. But we have to know that someone has to drink that cup. Someone has to do it. Some human, not an animal, but some human has to do it. An actual descendant of Adam, because it was Adam who brought it in, so a descendant of Adam has to somehow be worthy enough to drink that cup and pay for all of this, to satisfy the righteous anger of the great judge, Or else all of us will suffer the right and proper justice and punishment for our sin. Now Peter, of course, doesn't understand this. So Peter fights in his own way, a human way, a fleshly way. He picks up a sword, a man-made sword. And with the strength of man, he attacks man. With the violent tactics of man. Thinking, I'm going to save my Savior. It's foolishness. You can't save yourself. And your Savior doesn't need help saving yourself. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Church, Jesus will drink the cup. And as we already know, he did drink the cup because it was the Father's will. Because without Jesus, all the men and women who have come and gone before him have all fallen short. Without this Jesus, there is no hope because no one is worthy to drink this cup. I'm going to take you to Revelation chapter 5. This is the same John who is writing our gospel, who sees a picture, kind of a behind the scenes, pull back the curtain, what's going on in the spiritual realm. In John chapter 5, verse 1, 
John says, I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. This is God the Father. This is the judge. The judge who has all this righteous anger. I saw in his right hand, the one who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. You can kind of picture this scroll as kind of being like the deed to the land of earth and our lives and your, your eternal life. I saw this scroll and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And John says, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, so neither living nor dead, no one was able to open the scroll or to even look into it. No one, no one could take this, this proverbial cup. And I began, John says, to weep loudly because no one, no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And in verse 7 it says, and he, he went, this lion of the tribe of Judah, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him, the judge, who was seated on the throne and when he took that scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before this lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, singing, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they, get this part, church, they shall reign on the earth. They shall reign on the earth. We will stand with our king on the earth, ruling and reigning with him on that day. And it says in verse 11, then John says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. Church, no one was worthy on the earth or under the earth except for one, and that is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. He was worthy to receive this cup and he drank it dry to the very last drop so that the wrath of God against humankind would be satisfied, so that he would establish his kingdom on this earth on that day, a kingdom that will have no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no tears, no cancer, no evil, no sin, no death, a kingdom church that cannot be shaken and a kingdom that will have no end. So let us, church, as Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to that Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who for the joy set before him, the joy set before him, he endured the cross and he drank the cup of God's wrath, despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, church, he did this all for the joy set before him, the joy of glorifying his Father, the joy of satisfying the wrath of God against you and me because the Father gave you and me to him to save. He did it for the joy of being with you for all eternity. That's why he drank that cup. That's why he laid down his life. He did this for you. And you, Christian, even after you pass away and into the grave, you will, on that day, stand with him on earth. 
you will stand with him on that Mount of Olives. If you've never been to Israel and you don't think you ever will, guess what? Your ticket's already punched. You're going to get there. There won't be any tour buses in the background. Just God's people and our King. And with your own eyes, the very eyes that are in you right now, with these eyes, and Job says, not another. No, these ones right here. With these eyes, because you're going to be resurrected from the dead. With these eyes that you are seeing life right now, you will use these eyes to see God stand upon the earth, <laughs> the King of Kings. As I close in prayer now, I just I want to share with you one thing that came to mind that my dad said. I think it was just yesterday. He said that he just he has more peace than he ever has, and he just every time he thinks about and talks about seeing Jesus, he just he he can he can see him. He says, I know that my last breath here will come right before my first breath in heaven. And that gives him peace and comfort. And that's a peace and comfort that all of us should have. That our last breath here is just the last breath before the next breath. It just won't be here. It'll be in the presence of the King of Kings. Let's pray. Father, as we think about and consider these truths that are just too wonderful for us, we would just, I hope and pray that the feeling, the inward feeling that I would get when I think about these things would be like Job. When Job thinks about seeing you seated, on your throne, standing on the Mount of Olives with his own eyes in his own flesh, he says, my soul faints within me. And I would just pray for myself that the very thought of seeing you face to face with my own eyes would would bring me to tears, would cause my soul just to crumble in awe and wonder and praise and amazement that you came to this earth with joy and endured the cross for me so that I could stand with you on that day on the Mount of Olives. That what those disciples saw in Acts chapter 1 was nothing compared to what they're going to see in the future. They saw you ascend from the earth and into heaven, and that was nothing compared to the glory that's going to return to this earth. God, that my mind would would go there each and every day, be reminded of that truth, that it would change the way I live. Help us, Lord. Help us as a church. As we continue to grieve and mourn, We also ask, God, that in that you would bring comfort, that you would bring somehow joy in our mourning, that you would bring us peace so that we can declare and be your witnesses that though we will die, yet we will live. And God, I want to pray even specifically for this afternoon as so many will be gathering to weep and mourn. We know that it's a good thing for us to weep and mourn together. It's important for us to do this. It's hard, it's painful. It just sometimes it just feels like we're kind of reopening a wound when we do these kinds of things, but we know that it's 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 important for us to weep together. But I want to pray specifically because I know that Brittany was so, so dearly loved by so many. She touched so many lives. 
And I know there's going to be a lot of people here today that, that don't know you. They know Brittany. And they've probably heard of you because of her. But they don't yet know you. And we just want to pray that as the hope that Brittany held on to goes forth in that service this afternoon, we pray that eyes would be opened, hearts would be changed, people would be saved, born again. But like how she affected my dad in the very brief six-day overlap of his cancer diagnosis and when she went into the hospital, she, she impacted my dad, and my dad now is born again. We pray that there would be more of those this afternoon, that you would use her and her testimony and her witness as she was empowered, just like those that Jesus said we would be, given the Holy Spirit to be witnesses She's been that for so many people. We pray that those seeds that were planted in their lives would be reaped this afternoon. We thank you, God. Bring many that don't know you this afternoon. And Lord, would you bring many to saving faith in your son? We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.